Run it up, to run it back. Run it up, to run it back. Run it up, to run it back. Good morning. Run it and up, welcome. This is Run It Back, back. Yeah, on yeah. FanDuel TV. Why are you guys wearing the same hoodie? Why aren't you wearing the hoodie? Right. Well, y'all didn't tell me. I do Miss have Blazer. the hoodie. I'm all springy. Wednesdays are family days. Okay, well, yeah. no, thank you for leaving me Duh. out. Uh, next Wednesday, I will be prepared. Can you imagine if Shams tuned in from Zoom with the hoodie on? Did you have the hoodie on? <laughs> no, but it's close. Oh, come on. Guys, we're all together. You gotta admit, it looks funny. You didn't, get camera, the, you didn't get the all black memo today, Michelle. I'm I know, I thought we were that. doing springtime. It's lovely out. I just wanna keep scooting over here with you and Michelle on an island. <laughs> this is the dumbest beginning of a show ever. But it's about to get good because we're immediately going to Shams. Oh, Shamsi, what's going on with the Lakers? Look at the colors behind me. It all makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so sources tell me the Lakers are zeroing in on J.J. Redick as the front runner for their head coaching job. Obviously, this has been a search that started in early May when Darvin Ham got let go. The Lakers are still going through their process. They're still, you know, really taking their time with this search. The belief around the NBA is that any potential hiring of Redick would come after the NBA Finals. That's where his focus is right now. And, and, and for the Lakers' part, they have to interview other candidates. Uh, but, but from what I'm told, they have been infatuated with J.J. Redick and, and his potential as the coach, not only for the short term, not only for LeBron James and Anthony Davis now, but the long term, four, five, six years down the line. When you think about a long term head coach and someone that you know can have the gravitas to lead this current group, and their, their search has been seriously focused on him and James Brago, the Pelicans associate head coach, over the last couple of weeks. They had two, they've had two meetings with James Brago. The second one came last week at the Lakers facility. Uh, but J.J. Redick was the first candidate to meet face-to-face -face with the Lakers and Rob Palenka uh, three weeks ago. Brago's gone a couple times. And there is real belief around the league that, that this job is going to be J.J. Redick's to lose. Mm -hmm. But he is <laughs> color commentating for the NBA Finals right now. And the Lakers will continue to move along in this process uh, that they have with no real timetable for a hiring. James Borrego, who's... Uh been coaching since 2001. I'm sure loves being uh, <laughs> put in the sentence with the guy they're infatuated with. I, I, I don't even know what to say. I mean, listen, I think the whole concern is what you just said, the inexperience, the youth. Uh, he, he's never done it before, but I also think that helps him. There's no, there's no, there's no bad resume. There's no blips on <laughs> his, you know, on his resume right now. And he does know the game. Now, does that translate to him being a good coach, that hasn't worked all the time. Darvin Ham knew the game. Steve Nash knew the game. There's there's mo there's really good players that knew the game that didn't correlate to a good coach. Sure. So, uh, listen, I think it can go one of two ways. I just think the the expectations to win a championship right away and your first ever coaching job is the head coach of the Los Angeles Lakers. I think that's what people are like kind of open-eyed about like can he handle this can he get respect from the locker room we know he knows the game we know he's great on tv commentating and the play-by-plays he's fresh it's out a little right? sensitive no for a high he's, profile job like this yeah well listen if you're sensitive about this kind of stuff and and, and you know you're the, taking the lakers job when you're going on a losing streak it, it, that, that's what comes with it. that's what comes with media that's what comes with these kind of jobs um, and a lot of times coaches get raw deal i think jj Bick, uh, JJ, jb bickerstaff just got a raw deal and he did a really good job so even doing a good job getting wins sometimes isn't enough in the NBA. So I think he's young enough, he's good enough on TV that if it doesn't work out, he will always have a job, you know, on TV. But it's just there's high expectations for this job and there's a must win. And then the, where the situation of this team is right now is so many unanswered questions and where they're moving. Is LeBron going back? There's, there's a lot of unanswered questions. And J.J. Reck, there's going to be a lot on his plate when he takes his job. But... At the end of the day, it is the Lakers. It's a great, it's it's a huge gig. It's a hell so of a first job. Congrats, because it is an awesome first job, for wow. sure. I just don't want it to end, you know, in a dumpster fire when they don't win a championship in the next three years, and he's the next scapegoat. Does anyone else cringe when, you know, Shams is reporting the news on this, and it's like <clears throat> the Lakers say they're looking for someone for the next five or six years, when none of us, I, I mean, I think none of us believe anybody's lasting six years mm -hmm. in that organization. That's not been the track record for the very, uh, near past so I, I don't know this whole thing I don't know what they're doing it, it, it just seems like a splashy hire and I'm not sure what the point is you know JJ and I we haven't crossed paths very much in our careers and our lives um, don't really know him personally we've obviously we've competed against each other for a number of years I'm rooting for him I want him to be successful I, I want it to be something um, that he can turn into a, a worthwhile career and, and be a reputable coach um, in the NBA for years to come 
I just I just hate that this is the this is the start. You know, as a player, I'm sure he's seen the <clears> amount <throat> of criticism that coaches that have had this seat have endured throughout the years, and and now for you to step into that seat after the type of season that they've had in in the, in the last couple of seasons with um, so much um, surrounding Coach Ham and the Lakers and LeBron and. You know, now you, you, you're bringing in the, the Bronny X factor of, oh, yeah. you know, people having conversations about that. And it's going to be a lot of man. It's going to be a lot to manage for a guy um, who's going to be a rookie head coach and one of the most sought out jobs um, in all of sports, not just basketball. Yeah. So, you know, I wish him well. I hope it works out. But it's, it's going to be a tough ha- amount to climb for him. The interesting thing for me is they just did this with the with the first time head coach with Darvin Ham, and it yep. didn't that's the con- out. That's right? the confusing so that, part. That's the only part that confuses me is that just happened. So I thought they'd go with an experienced guy, a guy that's been a head coach, a Borrega, an Atkinson, some, a J.B. Bickerstaff, someone like that that's been there before. But on the flip side, he is a young, fresh face. He's almost a celebrity with how much you see him on TV, the podcast. So he almost fits that culture of the Lakers. He's fresh out. Is where, that right? He's fresh out to where he knows the players. He can he can probably be very good at recruiting and free agent meetings. They're always going to have the backing of the Lakers. It's always going to be L.A. So it could, listen, it could work. It, it, could, it could very much well work. And now they get a young coach for the future. It just hasn't in a really long time here. So that's where the, the optimism comes from. Is he up. too fresh out to have respect <clears throat> Uh, just given to him by players that are only a few years younger? Well, maybe on the Lakers, yes. On a young, rebuilding team, no. I right. think kids would look up to him. I think kids would look up to the great J.J. Redick from Duke, the guy on <laughs> TV, the guy with the big podcast, the guy that's fantastic calling games. You know what I mean? So that type of team, yes. Now, when you have a podcast with LeBron James and he is the face of the franchise, that also helps when you have him in your pocket and you guys are on the same page. So if that relationship is strong, mm-hmm. I do think it'll trickle down the rest of that roster, and I think he'll have some success early. They're gonna make, they're gonna always swing for the fences, adding new pieces. But it's just a lot for a first-time coach that has never coached in the industry before. Man, like not even a little bit. Not even like kind how, of, not uh, on a bench, coach, not on a summer nothing. league, nothing. nothing. You know, it's gonna nothing. be, it's gonna be crazy, and that would be like the like an NFL yeah. team hiring Romo just because he's really good on TV with zero coaching Correct. experience, zero you know assistant, no, no yep. front off, nothing. That's exactly what it'd be like. So it's it's we I, would crush. I, I, although they did do that with Jeff Saturday in, at the Colts, but it was temporary and it didn't last forever. It, it's temporary and it didn't last forever. <laughs> But yeah, I mean, it's you know, and he was a very loved. And didn't dude, he loved play like, on the Colts and like played there? Just, just, yeah, yeah, he was a player <clears throat> there, former player. I, this is high risk, you know. If JJ is very successful in the things that he's doing right now with everything that we just mentioned, and you go get this job, it doesn't work out, and you try to go back to that, that kind of puts a cloud on everything that you've built. Like if he goes back to TV? Yeah. I got a question for Sean. That puts puts everything that you've you've built kind of in jeopardy as far as the fans go. Yeah. Yeah. Shams, can he still do his own podcast as the head coach of the Lakers? The three men and a baby or whatever? That's the question that I've been asked by people. But, I mean, theoretically, it's it's hard to, to do that. You know, if you're still doing it with with your star player, you know, let's say you're on a back-to-back or no you know, three-game right. losing streak, and you're recording no. like the 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 the, the, the question around the league also with a guy like wh- whoever is going to be the coach, right? JJ Redick, especially the first time in coaches, it's a totally different grind when it comes to coaching and the hours and everything like that. So that's going to be something to translate as well. And just when you look at this job overall, it. it Whoever the Lakers go with, J.J. Redick, otherwise, it, the job is, is, is about coaching and getting the best out of Anthony Davis. He's the one who's 31 years old in the prime of his career. He has a runway to be a Laker far longer than LeBron James. LeBron James is going to play up to two more NBA seasons, for what I'm told. Le- Anthony Davis's runway is going to be much longer than that in L.A., uh, potentially. It, it, and so hiring <coughs> the right coach for him, and obviously he's had a rapport with James Borrego, um, but at, at the end of the day, this is where the Lakers are at so, in their process. So hear me out on this. So if I'm Anthony Davis and I am the building block for this franchise moving forward and I want James Borrega and then they don't hire him and hire J.J. Redick and he still does the podcast <coughs> with He's LeBron James. Doing a, can't do it. What, <laughs> what, is Anthony Davis going to be cool with that? No, he can't. Absolutely. But he can do his... Oh, oh, well, he's not even going to do that. He can't do the podcast. <clears throat> can you imagine losing a game No. and your head coach is on his podcast the no. next day 
discussing other issues besides the Los Angeles Lakers? Well, think about it. When Draymond would it. go do his podcast, like, the Even night of a Dray loss, I mean, he got it ruffled feathers. And he's I also just feel like, as the head coach of the Lakers, you have a lot on your plate, so you can't be doing all these other... Yeah, coaches things. get rid of their social media when they become coaches, because yeah. it's just like, you don't need the distraction. You it is fascinating, it. though. I'm curious to see how that pans out, because obviously it's, I wish it's well, never man. happened. All of it's fascinating. Wishing well is just a lot. It's just very L.A., <clears> and for <throat> that, I say... Thank you for what we do. Um, let's move on. Speaking of, we're not leaving L.A. too much. Uh, we're going to do a little preview here, but LeBron has jumped into the uh, the NBA Finals conversation. Uh, high praise for his former running mate. Take a listen. was nothing on the basketball floor that Kyrie couldn't do. And sitting here watching it, you know, I'm like, I'm playing like, so happy and so proud and to watch him and continue his growth and whatever the case may be. And at the same time, I'm so mad at the same time that I am not his running mate anymore. He's the most gifted player the NBA has ever seen. I mean, it's that last sentence. It's a, it's a dude. I'm just watching this as the best player of the Lakers and the head coach of the Lakers. Yeah, it was like, it was like, it was like bonding. Chop it up in a wine. It's a sick wine cellar. Um, oh, is that what that was? <laughs> yeah. My eyes wouldn't register. Yeah. Okay, go on. Well, what was the question? Uh, <laughs> the most gifted player the NBA has ever seen. Hey, listen, there's a lot. There's so uh, his size. It is very impressive. I think more gifted is a Kevin Durant that's seven foot that can do everything Kyrie Irving can do. But yeah, when you watch Kyrie Irving, it is it's poetry in motion, man. It is it is beautiful to watch. Like we always talk about his handle, how he has it on the string, uh, you know, his shot making ability, his finishing is elite. It's one of the best we've ever seen. So yeah, he is up there as one of the top, you know, top three, top five, just absolute hoopers, talented players, everything he does. So it, it really is awesome seeing him back to himself, seeing him happy, seeing him. He said the other day, this is the greatest portion of his career. Yeah. He's won a championship. He's had great years. He's the number one pick. But he, he so seems at ease. He's, at, like he's found peaceful. peace. Yeah. yeah, he's found peace. He's happy. All that other shit, that all the negative stuff, all the negative headlines, that goes out and winning cures everything. And the Dallas Mavericks are winning and they're winning a lot of games because of Kyrie Irving. So I'm super stoked for him. I love Kyrie. I think the, what he's been able to do and how he's been able to change the game, the way that it, he dribbles, the finishing, I think he's one of the, the greatest finishers of all time. You know, for me, that my vote would go to Kobe Bryant. So when, when we start talking about the GOAT conversations, I think LeBron were one of, one of the most dominant kind of guards. You know, nobody would want to get in front of LeBron when he was young and, and with a full steam of, <laughs> with a full steam going down the court and, and trying to finish at the rim. He was a freak of nature. Michael Jordan was a was a freak of nature. But when you talk about gifted and skilled, Kobe Bryant had it all. Left hand, right hand, finishing. He could shoot, three point shooter, <clears throat> had killer instinct, was all of those things. You know, so Kobe would get my vote for that. But in this current day and age, in this current generation of players. It's absolutely Kyrie, you know, and I'm glad that to see that he's back, um, getting the getting the recognition that he deserves. Out, that's not about things that aren't basketball related. Right. He was always a talented basketball player, always was doing his thing, but some of the other stuff kind of muddied the water. So I'm glad that we've got that narrative back in focus, and he's back in the NBA Finals. You know how you know it's Kyrie too, because it's not the fans, it's not the. It's not the. It's, it's his peers. It's players know it, like respect his game. P players think he's the hardest one-on-one -on -one matchup to guard. Players love watching him right. play. So that is when you know you have the respect. You know you're doing something right. Is when your peers and the guys you compete against every single night are saying this about you. So that is the uh, that's the biggest compliment you can get as a player. Do, you, do players like let's say he wins this title with the Mavs? Um, I would imagine like anything that maybe one's a little more favorited than the other. Do you think this one will mean more? I think so too, just because how they got here. This is a, this is a five seed that has no no one really predicted that would be here. And if they knock off the Boston Celtics, who've been the best team all year long, I do think this would mean more. He's happy, and a lot of this has to credit with the Dallas Mavericks organization, their staff. They have made him feel comfortable. They have shown him respect and treated him the way that he wanted to be treated in Brooklyn that he never got. Maybe in Boston that he never got. So a lot of that 
has to do with him fitting in and getting, and him and Luca having that dynamic of the maturity of going 1A, 1B, and switching off night night. It's worked, and it didn't really work last year. There were concerns yep. last year, and, and they purposely lost a game to get that pick to get Derek Lively, and Mark got fired. It was totally worth it. It, it yeah. was totally <laughs> worth it because now they are thriving, and I think this championship would mean more for him mm -hmm. just because of the whole everything he's been through, the negativity, and the players. The players don't don't care about him and his stance on no. COVID and all that stuff. They just know him as the hooper and how he's playing good, and they love to see it. That's another reason. Think about it. We're, players are so happy to see him playing well, and they're playing against him. That's how you know they love Kyrie Irving and respect Kyrie Irving. You know why this one is way more special? Even though Luka Doncic is a superstar, he's not LeBron James. So at this championship, I feels like Kyrie feels emboldened. Like I'm really a, a major part of this championship. This is a 50-50 split on this championship. Anytime you're with LeBron James, LeBron is gonna be the North Star. Sure. No matter what's going on, LeBron is gonna be the North Star. He's gonna be the center of attention. He's gonna be the focus. So with this one, I feel like Kyrie feels like this is my championship. This is my opportunity to show my genius and go out and get one. <clears throat> I feel like just time has changed the entire narrative. Just time. And winning and playing. Yeah. And you can just tell. You can see he's just, he's, he's, it's a refreshed Kyrie Irving and media and his post game and his interviews. Everything has changed. And it's just because he has found peace on the basketball court. He's happy with his family. Every, it's, what it's, if he it's walks all, in, though, into the Boston and just all of a sudden he's triggered? Just flicking off everybody. <laughs> right, everything comes like, flashing back. Just back. Goes, <laughs> blazing. I would love it. I mean, at first, I would love it too. But yeah, that, I, I know. I think he's. Yeah, it'll be interesting future. how he handles that. Yeah. How, he, how does he handle. The booze, how does he handle the heckling? How does he handle the harsh ass Oof. comments he's about to get from those fans that we know they can be pretty yeah, graphic? So stuff. it'll be interesting to see his level of maturity if he gets rattled, if he cares, if he tunes it out. Because you see the you see the clips when he was in Brooklyn. Yeah. The 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 it's so I would love I can't wait to see how far he's how, going. How does from it that. how does it work when you sage a place and then you flick everybody <laughs> off in there? How, well, how does I that feel work? like it's, those are counter I don't know. counterproductive <laughs> measures. I don't know how that goes. You're not supposed to sage and then bring the negativity back <laughs> in. Like, it's just not, I don't think. I mean, I'm not an expert. Um, Shams, you had some news yesterday on Kyrie. What was it? Yeah, Kyrie Irving is signing his first signature athlete for his Anta shoe line. And it's his dad, his father, Dredrick <laughs> Irving. This is the first time in pro sports a player has signed his dad to a signature shoe deal. And what's interesting here is Kyrie Irving is chief creative officer at Anta Basketball as well. So he's able to sign athletes, sign players. He's, he's been talking to other players about signing with Anta under his shoe line. But his first signing is his father, played at Boston University, played professionally in Australia. He's been actively involved in the designs from what I'm told. And his shoes, the Dredrick Irvings, will actually be in stores at Foot Locker mm. in September. So some interesting, unique, fun news on the eve of the NBA. Shams, I got a question. His father. I got a question for all of us. What the hell does that mean that he signed? I think it's dope. I think it's all, I yeah, was what? with I was with Anta. The, uh, the you were? Year. Yeah. Oh. That's really cool, but like, what is it? What is it? His dad's gonna has to wear his shoes on and off the, the court or the, to the I mean, game. He was an athlete, I would not be surprised if Kyrie Irving wears his dad's shoes, okay. but they're gonna be the Dredrick Irvings, and they're gonna be in stores. That's how they're gonna be promoted as, not just Kyrie Irvings. And <coughs> these are his dad's shoes. These are the shoes his dad has designed. That's crazy think, that Anta is in Foot Locker yeah. now. That's a big come up. Yeah, that's huge. I think this is more of an honorary thing. Yeah, oh, for nice. sure. No, yeah. I'm just saying I've never heard of something. This is. Yeah, this. like I, I don't think there is going to. It's awesome. Like we're not going to see his dad running around promo and marketing these shoes. <laughs> like are we like fitness doing meet enough? and greets and all of I mean, that? It would be kinda... I think this is just a, a, a honorary uh, position to take and just to honor my father, honor everything that we've been through together. I have an opportunity to, to do that on a, on a grand stage, and I'm going to give him his respect. You know what's love. cool, too, is he will do, like, a tour this offseason in China, like a shoe tour, and it's going to be with his dad. Like That's, that's actually it's, cool. It's crazy to think. Like a monster, yeah, monster turnout. All right, I like it. Uh, this is obviously the ramp up. The games start finally, finally tomorrow. Uh, so we're hearing from a lot of people this week, Jalen Brown being one of them, and he was talking a little bit about the lack of respect he gets. Various reasons, you know, I feel like uh, I don't get the, the, the credit or respect that I have earned. And uh, I just, I'm at the point in my life where it just, I don't give a, you know, I could, uh, I might never get it. And I'm okay with that. Um, I am who I am. I do what 
what I do, and I, I believe in what I believe in. So the ones who are with me, let's rock and roll, and the ones who aren't, like, can kiss my ass. Pretty much. Sheesh. Living that I feel him, but who doesn't? I understand because I think he's in the shadows of, of the titles, Jason the Tatum, accolades, and, and he has. But I think when he wins a championship, I think that changes. And also, your team respected you. They gave you the, the biggest deal say, in the history of the NBA. So you got the respect from the yeah. people that matters. What fans? Money's media, like the scoreboard of life. Yeah, fans, you media, uh, you know, trolls on social media. Who gives a you fuck what they think? Here. You, your team, the Boston Celtics, gave you hundreds of millions of dollars but, guaranteed. That to me is respect. But he does. I mean, he does get snubbed. Yeah, all he does, and that, and that, and that, I think will come with winning, and that will come with more postseason heroics, like he's done this year. Sure. Where he's damn near been the best player, he on this team. He has been a huge reason why they're winning. But I think if they win a championship this year, I think this whole narrative changes. But a lot of one B players like him <clears throat> feel this way. The, the Robins or to the Batman, there is that sort of like, damn, what about me? Why am I not? Did all we NBA? not just talk about Kyrie for 20 minutes? That's what he was to LeBron. Then he wanted to go somewhere exactly. else. Exactly, and was... now he so so. He's right. He probably will never get the respect that he deserves. Probably but not. he doesn't care. We shouldn't care. No, he's, he's comfortable in his own skin. He feels good where his career is headed, where it's been, the things that he's been able to accomplish. He's, he, I think, he has the the highest uh, salary in the NBA kicking in soon. So Jeez. listen. That's respect in itself. Just respect me all day. With one one thing he does get, he gets the respect from his peers. That's that's your that's the ultimate goal is to walk away from this game and the guys that you competed with and against say, bro, you were one of those guys. You were one of those ones, and he definitely gets that respect. As far as the outside, the media, and the fans, he just said it. He could give a fuck. That and is. I will say, he 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 didn't make All NBA this year. Nope. Like that's a joke. That's like, what I'm that's, saying. Yeah. But that's not even. I don't even think that's disrespect. I think that's idiotic. Like that—that that is just a voter. That, they, they missed. Yeah, they messed up. They—they—they they, they just fully messed up. If if they redid that, I think he'd be in it. I think there was. It's like I, I demand a recount of most. <laughs> like that is a fucking joke that he wasn't all NBA. <laughs> so I agree with that. Yeah, I mean, look, he's he's my favorite Celtic that's not named Derek White, and I look to him to be like the clutch guy. So I think there are a lot of us that actually look to Jalen Brown as the guy even though the narrative is not that that's put in front of us so but he doesn't care and that's all that matters um speaking of players that have to do things in these finals who who loses the most who has the most to lose i feel like there's one answer. you know i have an interesting opinion about this really i Dude. don't think i don't think anybody has anything to lose this is gonna the, for the first time in a long time some one of our young stars that we've been building up they're gonna get their first ring so you why build that. these young guys up to a place where somebody has to be knocked down or be criticized. Obviously, there's going to be criticism when somebody's going to lose, but I don't think they're, they're at stages in their careers where it's make or break time now. You know, these, these guys probably got another mm -hmm. nine to ten years of basketball left in their tank. Yeah, this isn't Chris Paul. Yeah, this isn't the end of, this isn't the, end of the road. Yeah. So who has more to lose in these finals? We, it's, we, we can nitpick and say it's, it's one or the other. It can be Luka, it can be Tatum, it can be... Jalen Brown or whoever else. This is an exciting time for, for everyone involved because everybody's still so young. So Al I, Horford. <laughs> there you go. There it is. We'll That's, take, we'll, yeah, Cal Al Horford has the most to lose yep, in, in this thing because he, he doesn't know how many more shots he's going to get at it. But as far as our young superstars, this is a time for us to really just sit back and enjoy where <laughs> the league is going. But, you know, obviously there's going to be things said either way it goes, but I, I don't I don't feel like either one of them has anything Lose being too, that's not how media works. That's how like, I what work, you, what man. You I'm sorry, Vito, you, you gotta know how I You gotta rip someone apart right I, now. Know. Hey, I'm all about, I'm all about sunshine, peace, it's and good vibes. It's all positive man. energy today, and your matching hoodies. The, uh, <laughs> He's not gonna agree. Okay. Yeah, the obvious answer is Jason Tatum. Okay, like, there, there, you the, the, there you the go. The obvious answer is Jason Tatum. He's been Fair. there before. He's been so dominant up until the finals. We've always talked about his postseason struggles. So now we just uh, we just watched. Look, even they knew I was going to say Jason Tatum with like the high. With the, come on, how about that? It, it, it has to be him because he is the best player. His his co-star just did a whole video on an interview on how he's not respected. Yeah. He's not. So he why would he that guy have any pressure? You know what I mean? Everything falls on the best player of the team. And Luca and Kyrie, this is newest express. They just got here. They are the five seed. They are two to one underdogs in this series. There is hmm. zero pressure on Dallas. Dallas could get swept, and this is still a hell what, of a season makes, for the Dallas Mavericks. What makes Boston, Boston different? different? What makes Boston because they different? are the big dog. Lou, we picked them pre yeah. We picked them in October to win it right. all. We picked.
picked them this year, but it ain't like we've been picking them for five years straight. And they, no, just, but they haven't been, been delivered. They've been really good for five years. Yeah, they've been really good, but they're still really young. That's true. He's in year seven. Luca's no, in year saying six. That, I'm not saying this is make still, or break, but I think if he loses this, if he loses this he final set, it. he is going to get shit on. They are going to drag him through the mud. They're going to say, "Here we go again." The guy can't win the big game. He freezes up in what the fourth quarter. What year was it when LeBron James won his first championship? Oof. I don't know. Conrad. Seven. No, I'm just. I, I, I'm not. This. That's two different arguments. I'm not saying there's not enough time for him. There's plenty of time for this yeah. team and Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown to win championships. All I'm saying is they keep dominating You're for the this East year. Yeah. this year. A one seed dominating heavy favorite to blow this in the finals against the Dallas Mavericks, who no one thought would be here. That pressure falls on the Boston Celtics, okay. and that pressure falls on Jason Tatum. He also now, said that, he's that, the no, best I, player, I, and like once you I say stuff like that, is this the end of the world? They lose? No, I think they're right back in the finals next year. And I think they run it back. Now, I, I, no I can problem. Go for that if we're talking about this year, this year expectations that you've put put on your team, put on yourself for this season. I, I can go for that. You know how these things go, though. It's like, ah, oh, they can't get it done. They, like, they're still very No, this very isn't like let's rip careers. the Celtics, yeah. Jason Tatum. I'm just saying, if there's pressure on one of these two teams, it's the Boston Celtics. If there's pressure on any of these players, it's Jason Tatum. He's the best player on the best team who is supposed to win. If they right. don't, there's going to be... Best, who's the best player left in the playoffs, in your opinion? Luka. So why is I don't really know him very much. I only talked to him a couple times. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know. He's but never I'm still heard a huge fan. So why wouldn't so why wouldn't the pressure be on the best player that's left in, in the playoffs? Because they are a worse team that is a two to one underdog in this series that is going into a, a, a series where no, they No no no. This question says which player has the most to lose in the NBA. Jason Tatum, because he's the best player on the best team that's supposed to win. If they don't, it's an issue. If the Mavericks don't win, who cares? They, they're the five seed. They're not supposed to be I there. I don't understand it. I don't understand That's the logic, though, behind them. I don't understand the them. difference in the logic. If you, if the best who do you think is going to win the series? I think I, I think it's the Boston Celtics, but you think it's the Dallas Mavericks. No, I don't. I've been picking the Celtics. I've been <laughs> I think it's the Mavericks. I've picked the Celtics to a championship all year long. I love the until Dallas they, Mavericks. Until they, got, until they started playing against the Dallas Mavericks. I need you to pull Mavericks. the clip. I'd never, you know, oh, I never. We, we have so we many. Have a highlight, we have a highlight film. <laughs> I've been picking the Celtics since October. I thought it was going to be the Celtics and Nuggets. You. you have been picking the Celtics until they were matched that's up my with the Dallas Mavericks. That's my homer. I thought it was going to be the Celtics and Nuggets. And what then, are you talking about? When the Western Conference playoffs started, you're like, I got the Mavs. That was all Homer talk. That was all Homer talk. <laughs> Who are we supposed to listen to? Who no, are all I'm saying is my no, preseason predictions, if we pull the tapes, were the Celtics I against agree. the Nuggets. That's what you now said. Now the yeah. Dallas, now they're playing good. Yeah, once they started dom dominating and playing good in the postseason, I shifted to, oh, they're going to win this. You For evolved. five months, you were, you were on that train. In month six, the Dallas Mavericks got hot train, in the postseason. They got, got hot. another trade and said, you know what? I'm headed towards Dallas. They got hot. They, they did got get hot. hot. They started oh, playing better. What do you want from me? They started playing better. <laughs> I never had Minnesota. I never believed in OKC. Hey, Luca, I don't know why you said you didn't know my boy. <laughs> See, now you now look. Now look at us. Boston all the way. Let's go. <laughs> Listen, I think it's going to be a competitive series, but I can't go against the best team, the number one seed that's supposed to win this series. I'm They're going two to. Two to one favorites. Forget. They're seven point favorites in game one. That's great. I'll take that money. Let's go. Wait, you like Dallas. Can let's, somebody let's in a free state put some clip. money on this for me? Because once this series starts <laughs> yep. and say Dallas goes but up 2-0. But if Dallas two goes up 2 then I might switch again because that's <laughs> logically they're going to win. <laughs> no, you can't that's do that. That's common sense. I just, it's can't on record now. No, it's on record. You can't switch. You We're can't done. do that. If you they're up 2-0, and oh, I have to stick with the Celtics even though I don't think Beetle, they're going to come back. What do you have to stand on? Business. Absolutely. So if, if they go down 3-0, I have to keep saying, nah, they're going to win four straight. I can't no, change just, my mind gotta, based on what I see. No, not in the series. Chandler. You can't win regardless. That's not how it works. God, stand on your God. business. There he is. Shams, Shams, Shams is still is here. Back, baby. <laughs> Tell him, Shams. Shams, stand on sorry. your business. So sorry you had to listen to any of that uh, and Shams. all of that. We love you. You're getting um, jumped, Shams. We're going <laughs> to see you tomorrow morning. Uh, we're going to take a quick break. When we come back, Nancy Lieberman joins the show. There she is! Come save me, Nancy! She's not gonna save you, dude. You're wrong! Run it back, yeah. Run it all. Run it back, yeah, yeah. Run it all, run it back, run it all, run it back. Nancy Lieberman, the Hall of Famer. Hall of Fame! Friends call her magic. Hall of Fame! She's one of the greatest basketball minds. How about that? She is back, the icon, the Hall of Famer, does some work with OKC. Just really uh, a staple in the basketball world. Nancy Lieberman is here. I'm happy you were able to join us this week. I know last week was a hot mess for all of us. Um, the good news is, since we had you on, 
A lot has happened in the world of WNBA. Kennedy Carter just threw everyone into a tizzy. Uh, we've not stopped talking about it for three straight days. Um, I want to start with really the foul itself, because that's where this all started. Some people had an issue with it. Some people didn't. What did you see in the foul on Caitlin Clark? Well, I mean, if uh, if I were Caitlin Clark, I would have punched her in the face. Uh, but I'm from New York, and I would have told her to fuck off. Yeah. And that would actually cure the problem, because I've known Kennedy since she was in high school here in Dallas. She's a tough kid. She's a really good basketball player. She's going to come after you because she's very physical, which is okay. Yeah. But damn, where's, where's Caitlin Clark's teammates? I'd be pissed as shit at my teammates that nobody came to my defense. You know, you know, Gretzky had a, had an enforcer. Michael Jordan had Oakley. I mean, that, that's honestly, it's just bullshit. This is this has to be better. Indiana has to be better. Somebody has to come to this kid's. Uh, I don't want to say rescue, right? But you guys know this better than defense. anybody, Michelle, as well. Uh, in 1984, when Michael Jordan came into the league, he changed the economics of the league financially with the GLA, with all the uh, TV contracts. He was on TV every game. Arenas were filled. When Tiger Woods uh, was tearing up the PGA when he first started, he changed the, the, the PGA world for every golfer financially. And, you know, people need to thank Caitlin Clark for being that generational athlete that is making them wealthy. They will have generational wealth. They would not have airplanes, charter jets without her. They wouldn't have been on you know, TV. And I know the W has worked hard over the last 20, 27, 28 years, but they weren't doing this with all the greats, with the Hall of Famers, with Lisa, with Tarasi, with Bird. It was still sporadic, you know, with some of the greatest players in the game, but Caitlin has caught the interest of the common person, both women, men, children, and we need to celebrate her, not tolerate her. She's a great kid. She's like LeBron. She doesn't want to, you know, mix it up with people, although she could, but, you know, they don't want to hurt their, their image. Hmm. And, but somebody needs to do something. I Look, back in 1997, I was a 39-year-old rookie for the Phoenix Mercury in the W. And there was a player in New York, uh, Rhonda Blades. She played at Vanderbilt. Rhonda called me. She goes, man, Spoon is jacking me every day in practice, Teresa Weatherspoon, who I adore. And I said, Rhonda, if you're going to let Teresa knock and beat the crap out of you every day, she's going to do it the whole season. Next time she does it, punch her in the face. And <laughs> it'll never happen again. And maybe I'm a street kid from New York. <laughs> But, and I had to do that. Look, when I played for the Lakers and Pat Riley in 1980 in Summer League, uh, I, in my first practice, legendary Pat Riley three hour practice, you know, the guys were very physical with me. I mean, you know, Lou Chandler, you guys are big, strong, you know, and I was getting roughed up. And I started two fist fights in practice, and nobody <laughs> ever touched me again. So, is, that, really cool. I mean, is this something? Of so is this something, you know, if you're the Bobby, head coach of the Fever, are you saying, okay, if you're a team, no more. If they put her on her ass, you put her on her ass harder, and, th and this, that, that's going to be the message going forward? Well, now, y y the answer is yes, Chandler. My first year coaching in the league, I never had a technical foul in the WNBA as a coach. And um, Doug Collins called me down to his office, and he goes, hey, you got to go up there and you got to get Tom Wilson to put 25 T's in your contract. And I went, why? He goes, because your players got to know you got their back and you're going to have to take some T's. Yeah. I, I just did not know this. I started yelling at the officials just for the hell of it. So my <laughs> players thought that I was like there for them, even though I thought some of my players were idiots. But I was like, you can't do that. Blah, blah, blah. You're going to need to give me a T. And... <laughs> It's just the way it went. So, yeah, a, a, a coach is going to have to take some tease. Um, she's going to have to talk to some of her players and say, do not let that happen again. And that's just the way of the world. you got to have somebody protecting your superstar. And she is a superstar. But there's a lot of jealousy. And as much as I love women and love the game, we got to stop being petty with each other. We need to celebrate her, not tolerate her. <clears throat> Ah, oh, it's a tale as old as time. Um, I, I'm curious what you think. Like, Lou, Lou's obviously 
entrenched in the women's game. Uh, I'm new, so I, I'm, lear I'm becoming a fan with everybody else at the same time. I'm also sitting back and watching a lot of experts who have a lot of opinions on things. So you know this league better than anyone. What is your opinion on what sort of transpired over the course of the last several days in this industry, this sports media world? Well, if you're still, if we're still talking about Caitlin Clark, uh, I, I think the world is in a really bad place. I think you know we wake up and we're protesting about things we don't even know what we're protesting about. I think people are trying to divide us. Uh, I'm not for segregation. I'm for inclusion, and I just think we're pitting people against each other. We're actually pitting minorities against minorities, which which is really sad. So. Uh, I, I think we have to take a step back and, and take a breath. What is it that we're trying to get out of this thing called a career? At at best, you get maybe 20 years, you know, Sue Bird, Tarasi, uh, they're an anomaly. I played a 39 and 50. I'm an anomaly. Uh, but what are we trying to get out of this? Hmm. And we have to do this together because nobody who's great has ever done anything by themselves. So the league is doing great stuff. But everything, they're making so many things racial at this point. And I think we just have to, you know, if there's a Larry Bird, he's a great white hope. If there's a Trevor, you know, uh, in boxing, if a guy comes along, he, you know, he's a great white hope. I was not the great white hope. I was just a, a baller, okay? And if we would just take away, you know, the, the, the shades that we're throwing at each other with color, and we're just ballers. We're just pl trying to play. We're one injury away from not being who we are. Larry Bird said this to me one time. He goes, I'm the greatest player in the world when I'm on the court, but when I'm on the bench, that guy in the stands is just as good as me. Hmm. So I just think we need to work hard. We're in a business, okay? This is not a girls club. It's not a boys club. This is business. We're in a trillion dollar industry and we have to grow it together. And we can, but we have to see a bigger picture. Thank you. Very, very, very well said. Um, <clears throat> Nancy, I want to switch gears over to um, the Thunder. Looking back on their season and all the success they had, would you would you consider it a successful season despite them being um, upset to the Mavs in, in the postseason? Uh, it was tremendous, Lou. I mean, really, uh, Sam Presti did such an incredible job um, with, you know, putting the dynamics of this team together. You know, winning is hard in this league. And to go from winning 17-plus games from the year before and then getting to the series with the Mavericks, it just said a lot, you know, um, I, uh, Sam even said it the other day, he had a little bit of a misstep with bringing in Gordon Haywood. Um, you know, I mean, think about it. If OKC gets Gafford or PJ Washington, mm -hmm. that changes the whole dynamics of that, that you know, uh, you know, series. Goes, yeah. But, you know, Nico Harrison gets them and look where the Mavericks are today. So th th the future in Oklahoma City is so bright. Th okay, think about this, guys. And I say, guys, m you too, Michelle. I know. <laughs> Kawhi, right? Kawhi wanted to win now. So, you know, he says, we, we got to get Paul George. So they trade that young Shea, SGA, to Oklahoma City for picks and for Paul George. And, you know, look what Shea's done. I mean, I joked with him one day, you know, he's... 25, he's about to age out at Oklahoma City because these guys are like 19, 20, 21, 22. They are like tighter than tight. I mean, they're unbelievable, that team. Chet was better than advertised, right? He kind of surprised us. I think uh, I might screw this up, but he was the only uh, player in history to have 100 threes, mm -hmm. 100 blocks, and 100 assists for a big. <clears throat> It's pretty unbelievable, right, with all the great players in the league, in the history of the league. Uh, he changed the dynamics defensively at the rim. He can block your shot, he can change your shot, and he can get in your head. Uh, and that's a stat that we don't see on a sheet. Uh, SGA is like a poet with the ball. Jalen Williams, uh, J, J, uh, Will, excuse me, J-Dub, he got so much better from the year before. And, and Coach Dagnall, I got I to gotta be honest, this guy is like, a, it's taken a master class when every press conference or every time I'm around him, he's brilliant. The guys really like him. And I'm going to get to the Lakers coaching. It, so the players, they adore <laughs> this man. He can be firm, but he can be fair. But he's he's got their back. 
And you have to have great interpersonal skills with players. I mean, they'll give up a little X and O's if they know you care about them. And they have that going in Oklahoma City. They're, they're destined to, to be a championship team. Yeah, Nancy, we had Isaiah Joe on the show yesterday, and he was basically talking about how it feels like an AAU team sometimes. Yeah. They're all so close. They all hang out. They all just want to win. The one weakness that they did have this year was rebounding, and they got out-rebounded in the postseason as well, which we kind of knew was going to happen with playing Chet at the five and, and kind of thin in that position. Is there someone you saw this year? I know you mentioned Daniel Gafford. Is there like a big you kind of had your eyes on? We are like, man, we should go after this guy this summer and kind of add that beef down low. You know, I, uh, it could be uh, an experienced NBA guy, but, you know, I, I, I think Sam is at the, uh, the point now where he still has so many picks that he can package this up. Um, I mean, we did have Al Horford a couple years ago, right? I mean, that was pretty unbelievable. Now Al is doing just playing the best ball of, of this point in his career. Um yeah, I mean, th there's bigs, but, you know, as you guys know this, uh, the money has to match up, the length of the contract has to match up, what do you have in cap space? So it's not just going after a name, it's going after somebody who can actually fit into your dynamics uh, of this team. Because you don't want to ruin this team. Like, everybody was talking about, well, they're going to get rid of Giddy. Well, he's part of that team dynamic that, that you know, he's a glue guy with the with his teammates. So so much of that is really important. What is it like uh, there, like in that community around that team, when the MVP talks are just at their hottest moment, and it's like everyone's just it's Jokic, it's Jokic, and then the Thunder show up and they're the number one team, and all of a sudden SGA because Lou was an SGA guy before the season even started for MVP, <laughs> and there was a lot of good arguments to be made for him to get it. What was it like? being around the team i mean was it a no-brainer everyone thought this is his well you know he was in the mix the year before and he makes the all-star team for the first time sga came back in and he was better than ever he you know i mean people forget he's six foot six he's long he he can play a slow man's game and then he has that burst and explosiveness he's a very uh, a willing passer he can hit his three-point shot. I know he continues to improve on that, but he's got moves. He's got counter moves. He's got uh, just the angles, a right hand, left hand. I know you guys were talking about Kyrie and his left hand. Shea is unbelievable with balance, uh, leverage, and he can just, he's got such spatial awareness that he can just get through a, a, a hole. You think you're trapping him, and he's gone, and now he's bringing that second-level player up. He knows where his, you know, uh, next pass is. And really, he's unbelievable. And he, he was one of the best. I think he led uh, in steals. He's got, you know, in the league for guards. He's one of the best rebounding guards in the NBA. A <clears throat> tremendous defender. And if you, you know, when you have Chet, you can actually play harder, right? Lou, when you got a big guy uh, or, or Chandler, you got a big guy on the inside, you can really play hard on the perimeter because if you miss, if you, you know, get attacked, there's somebody behind you to clean up that mess. But it allows you to play with that energy and that effort and be a dog on the perimeter because if you have nobody there, I don't care what anybody says, nobody wants to look bad if somebody, you know, blows by you and there's nobody rotating, mm -hmm. you know, the lower guy is not there. So that whole team is wrapped around what SGA does. They adore him. He's kind. Uh, he cares. He's so he's intelligent. And he, he'll, he'll be in that uh, MVP voting for many years to come. Lou's going to have him again before next season. For sure. I already see I'm it a, in his eyes. I'm a huge SGA guy. Yep. I, I had the pleasure of playing with him for a season, and I, I just loved the kid. I thought he, I thought he was great. By the way, you don't hear people described as kind very often Rarely, anymore. But he, very but underrated. He's literally kind. I know. That's like. a it's a good quality. Um, head coach of the power in the big three, first woman coach of men's professional team, won a championship. So what what has that entire experience been like? Experience has been fantastic until uh, you guys mentioned JJ Reddick and you didn't put me in that group. Um, so I called my therapist uh, before I came. In. Fair enough. I get it. <laughs> Uh, no, I think JJ would be great. But, you know, coaching men is normal to me. I'll, I'll tell you this. In 2011, when I was hired, 
uh, by the Dallas Mavericks to be the head coach of their G League team. It had never happened before in an NBA affiliate. And I got invited to the White House, and uh, President Obama was there. And he was in a big press conference, and then he comes over to me and my son, TJ, and, you know, he goes, Nancy, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a black man. I just happen to be the president of the United States of America. It's mm -hmm. normal to me. I've been this my whole life. He goes, you just happen to be a white woman <laughs> coaching predominantly black men. You, this is normal to you. You've been doing this. I mean, you were playing in Harlem. You were playing in Brooklyn. You were playing all over in the streets against men. You know, and he mentioned the Lakers and things like that and playing for the Utah Jazz and, and Frank Layton. He goes, this is normal to us. It's not normal to the outside world. He goes, that is our job, is to make this normal. In 2024, we're normalizing seeing me on a bench in the NBA with the Kings, uh, seeing me in the W, seeing uh, Becky, seeing, you know, Ginny Boo. But we need to have more of this. So if Jackie Robinson is the first, uh, you know, man of color to go to Major League Baseball and he's a one-off, we have failed. But then Larry Doby came and Elston Howard came and, you know, now the, the league has changed. Same with basketball. So we just can't have a one-off. I mean, why should I not be interviewed for a head coaching job of coaching every league and won yeah. championships. And I'm not saying you have to hire me, but allow me to go through the process. Allow Becky to go through the process. Allow mm -hmm. Teresa Weatherspoon to go through the process. Maybe you'll find out we see something differently than you. Mm -hmm. And then it's called collaboration. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, I, I'm comfortable in my own skin. I, I love being around you guys in the locker room. Uh, there's a lot of respect. Uh, I'm firm, but I'm fair. Uh, and what we're trying to do, I'm trying to get you guys to your next contracts. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to get you to generational wealth mm -hmm. and to places you never, you know, maybe thought you could get to. And uh, you do this together in coaching. And it's okay to tell your, your players you love them or you care about them because you're just big, big boys. <laughs> and you want to be cared for by your coaching Absolutely. staff. Shit, Nancy, if I was a and free I, agent I, after this conversation, I'm going, I'm <laughs> signing with you. I'm telling you. I swear. Nancy, I want to I want to ask you really quick. Um, Ice Cube made a made a lucrative offer to Kaylin Clark to to join the big three. Um, do you think that was, that was something that she should have actually considered? Hmm. I do. I do think she should have considered it because Dion played in two leagues, Bo Jackson played in two leagues, football, you know, and baseball. And they both excelled. I, I thought it was a lot of money on the table. It was five million to play, five million in merchandising, and Damn. five million for ownership of, of part ownership of a team. It was only for eight games, and there was only one conflict in the schedule. And they would have taken a private jet and flown her to the to the Indiana game. Yeah, I would I would have done that. Um, and Caitlin's a, a friend of mine, and I don't want to get in the mix of that because she has her agent, but. Why not? If you play in the WNBA, it's groundbreaking. If you play in both leagues, it's world breaking. Yeah. I mean, nobody else has done that. Why not do things nobody else has done? That's a great point. Dang. That's this has point. been awesome. Yeah. I am so glad we got you back on, Nancy. I appreciate all of the time, all the insight. Um, hope we'll have you on again soon. And by the way, get your podcast game up. Then the Lakers will come <laughs> calling. This is how it all works. You know this. Uh, then I'm going to slide in with you guys. Yeah, yeah, perfect. It's perfect. Thank we'll be right you so back. Much. <laughs> hey, thank you so much for having me. Ooh, NBA playoffs have tipped off. It's not too late to get in on the action with FanDuel because right now new customers get 150 bucks in bonus bets with any winning $5 bet. Use your bets on same game parlays, live bets, championship futures, and so much more. No better place to bet all the playoff action than America's number one sports book. Just download the app to get started. FanDuel, official sports betting partner of the NBA. Do you see how I do that, Chandler? I, I got to admit, it's really you good. are a monster Thank at you. the Pro Bowl. Thank you. Thank you. I pride myself on it. Um, yeah. Guys, Drew Holiday, I want to I want to talk about him a little bit. I know the games are getting started and we'll have a lot to talk about, but he is obviously considered the Celtics' best defender. Who should he be guarding mostly here? 
You know what? I, I would start him on Luca just because I feel like he's he's big, he's physical. Luca can get irritated, he can get under <laughs> Luca's skin, he can get Luca talking to the refs early. So I would do that. But it'll be interesting to see who they start him on because I feel like that is who they think will have a bigger impact oh. in this series. And they do have the luxury of having another great wing defender in Derek White. I imagine they switch a lot of guard to guard action because um, Jalen Brown and Jason Tatum, they're both capable as well. So I would start him on Luca just because I think Luca is the guy that you kind of want to shut his water off a little bit and let the other guys kind of contribute but Kyrie is just as much of a threat so it will be I don't know who they'll start on but I would pick Luca but I'm very interested to see who he actually starts on because that is a tell-all of who they think is going to have a huge a bigger impact I like the idea of getting under Luca's skin early <clears throat> yeah I don't think you can speed Luca up though that's my whole thing mm -hmm. Luca's seen it all done it all Kyrie has as well but I don't think you can speed him up so I will put Drew on on Kyrie take out the X Factor you know, take out the guy that can that can create plays for other guys that can finish at the rim. You know, because Luca's gonna play around that three-point line a lot. When he plays inside of the three-point line, he's looking to be a distributor most of the time. He's looking for those lob looks or the kickouts to those corners. When Kyrie gets in that, when a Kyrie gets inside that three-point line, he's looking to score that basketball. And so, I think Drew would be more effective uh, on Kyrie in the sense of how, in the sense of the way that both of these teams play. But like I said, you can't speed Luca up, so why even waste your time with Drew pressuring him up the court? Put him on, put him on Kyrie, and just take him out. And he's gonna need his rest. <clears throat> and again, Derek White is just as capable. He's obviously not as as of elite of a defender, sure, but, but when you have the luxury to have both of those guys, they're both gonna see time and spend time on both. So they're in a really good situation. When you look at the matchups too, the Celtics match up really good when you look at each of the, the, the lineup. So. It's going to be tough. Dallas is going to have to be elite, and both of these guys are going to have to be good, and the other guys are going to have to make shots. I've it's thought about it. Lot. Nancy Lieberman, coach of the Lakers. Let's make it happen. Let's do it. All right, we'll talk more about that it. tomorrow. <laughs> and the finals. Run it back, See you then. Run it up. Run it back. Run it up. Run it back. Run it up. Run it back. Run it up.